one of these is a topic of enduring puzzlement and that is entanglement and i have a, a few different questions here one i mean what are some common misunderstandings of the phenomenon maybe that's where we should just start well, I think, you know, entanglement arises directly from that statement we made long ago that when you have a quantum system, you do not have separate wave functions for each part of it. You only have one wave function for the whole thing. And the job of the wave function is to make predictions for observational outcomes. So if that's all true, then it could be the case that if you predict the outcome for one thing and another thing, particle A and particle B, there might be correlations or connections between those measurement outcomes. So I don't know what I'm going to see when I ask what is the spin of particle A, and I don't know what I'm going to see when I ask what is the spin of particle B, but I know they're going to be opposite. So then that's entanglement, and it tells me, were I to measure particle A, I have no idea what I'm going to observe, but as soon as I do, I know what the outcome is for particle B. And this bugs people because how does particle B know what its outcome is supposed to be? It could be light years away, right? This bugged Einstein. This was the point of his famous EPR paper in 1935. And so I think that people get the idea, and also from the word entanglement, that entanglement is somehow a force, that it's somehow an influence, right? That you can sort of tug on it, that, you know, there is some mystical thing that connects all of us through quantum entanglement. But really, it's a very, very precise mathematical thing. You can make predictions about the measurement outcomes for one entangled subsystem based on the measurement outcomes of another entangled subsystem. That's it. You cannot use that to send information or to have any influence or anything like that. So in particular, because I don't know what measurement outcome I'm going to get when I look at the first particle, I can't force the other particle to have any particular state at all. So I can't push it around by doing anything over here. So I, I do think that if we had discovered quantum mechanics before classical mechanics and we had really internalized the lessons of, of quantum mechanics, we wouldn't call it entanglement. Because entanglement suggests that we start with two subsystems and there's some mystical force between them. As we said, the whole quantum picture says there's only one system, the wave function of the universe. And what's interesting is that under the right circumstances, we can profitably describe it as different subsystems obeying certain kinds of rules. One, I think this, this connects to the inability to send information, but... Can you clarify for me the the distinction between maybe a causal connection between the two entangled particles and then a statistical correlation between them? We don't know what's happening between them. That is one of the things that is, you're going to get a different answer depending on your favorite version of the foundations of quantum mechanics. Okay. So in Everett, what you would say is that when I measure one particle, particle A, Alice's particle, and Bob's particle, particle B is way over there, nothing happens over there necessarily. Uh, it's going to depend on your description. Maybe something happens, maybe something doesn't. But the point is that the wave function of the universe doesn't undergo any dramatic shift right away. Right where you are, you branch into two possibilities, right? On one, you Alice gets a certain answer. On the other, Alice gets a different answer. And then, and this is very complicated, and I don't like it, and it's hard to explain, but there are two different ways of describing what happens next. One way is these branches, one which Alice says spin up and Alice, the other one Alice says spin down, instantly propagate across the universe simultaneously everywhere. And so now there is a branch on which Bob gets spin up and a branch on which Bob gets spin down. And the rules of quantum mechanics are that if Alice got spin up, Bob got spin down and vice versa. But there's another way of doing it where the branching sort of stays inside the light cone. It propagates out at the speed of light or less. And all of the light cones sort of match up together in a nice way in the future. And someone like David Wallace would argue in favor of that. The truth is it doesn't matter because this idea of branches is much like tables and chairs, a higher level emergent phenomenon. It's a way that we human beings describe what's happening, but the wave function of the universe, all it ever does is obey the Schrodinger equation. Laplace's demon doesn't know about branches of the wave function. It doesn't know about measurement collapses or any of those words. It just has a wave function that obeys the Schrodinger equation at all times. So, you know, again, that's my that's the way that I would explain it using many worlds, it sounds kind of contrived and hard to understand, but that's because 
we are trying to force our human intuitions onto what the wave function is doing. Since this is a place where the foundations are concerned, does that mean that it's a place where, at least the way that physics and philosophy departments are currently set up, it's a place where philosophers are more interested in getting their hands dirty than physicists? And physicists have just kind of moved on and are happy with the predictive capacity of the theory. But at this point, you think it is answering these questions that will be very helpful with moving the standard model forward. Well, it's interesting because, of course, um, if you have some question that is physics adjacent, like the foundations of quantum mechanics or like the existence of black holes in the 1950s, but that you can't do any experiments on, physicists will tend to ignore it. And they can they can happily go on and just do other things. But then that situation can change historically, right? You know, in the 1960s, we realized that quasars are powered by black holes, and suddenly people became very interested in them. Also in the 1960s, John Bell proved his theorems. He proved theorems about the different predictions between a local theory and a non-local theory like quantum mechanics. And that made it an experimentally accessible question. And so people did the experiment and they just won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So physicists are very interested now because there's an experiment you can do. Of course, the experimental result was exactly what Schrodinger would have predicted back in the 1920s. It didn't change our idea of quantum mechanics. But as long as you can do an experiment, they're happy. Having said that, because physicists have ignored the foundations of quantum mechanics for so long, even the Nobel Prize press release botched it. They gave the wrong explanation for what was going on because they didn't really understand what they had just given the Nobel Prize for. So physicists still have a long way to go to understand these foundational questions. Moving on. Moving on.